entering the sanctum sanctorum. Sir John? No, oh, young Tice. Let me handle this. There's nothing I enjoy more than a good whack at the seats of the mighty. Sir Oliver? Yes? Ah, oh, yes, Tice. Forgive me for intruding, sir, but I feel this is truly an historic moment. Sir Oliver French, I have the great honor to present the man who found Dr. David Livingston. Mr. Stanley, I presume. Yes, sir, I'm Stanley. <laughs> Mr. Stanley, this is Mr. Vane. How do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Permit me to congratulate you upon your incredible accomplishment. Incredible, perhaps, but nonetheless accomplished. If we seem a bit hesitant to accept Mr. Stanley's story of his face value, please don't think we... I know, you want the proof. Mr. Stanley has it. Has he? Mr. Stanley, Lord Tice, did I understand my son to say you have proof that you found Dr. Livingston? Yes, sir. I have the documents here. Dr. Livingston instructed me to give you these, sir. Mm -hmm. An imposing mass of evidence, I must say. If it was compiled by Dr. Livingston. Oh, Father, for heaven's sake, be reasonable. I'll be glad to accept the judgment of the society. Well, nothing could be fairer than that, eh, French? No. Very well, Mr. Stanley. I'll appoint a committee to examine these documents and instruct them to make their report at our next general meeting at Brighton. Thank you, sir. I'm certain, Sir Oliver, that the meeting will be one long remembered by all of us. I'm certain it will. Livingston is supposed to have entrusted to Mr. Stanley. And here is a letter which I personally know was written by Dr. Livingston some 15 years ago when he was in England. I have carefully compared them, and in all honesty, I cannot conclude that they were written by the same hand. Would you say, Mr. Cranston, that they were written by two different hands? Yes, I should say so. But can't we assume that the trembling hand of an old man, racked with fever, will produce a different character of writing from that composed by a man in his prime, as Dr. Livingston was 15 years ago? That's an assumption, sir, not proof. Thank you, Mr. Cranston. And now, gentlemen, the maps which Mr. Stanley claims were drawn by Dr. Livingston have been examined by the expert cartographer, Mr. Frederick Holcomb. Uh, Mr. Holcomb. As there are no other maps of this unexplored territory with which to compare these, naturally I cannot accept them as correct. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kingsley. By the same reasoning, Mr. Holcomb could not possibly have accepted the maps of Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Isn't it true, Mr. Holcomb, that those maps could have been drawn as well or as poorly by a child who had never been ten miles from London? Well, that's putting it rather strongly, Lord Tice. Would you say that the rivers and mountains so generously indicated on those maps might not exist outside of Mr. Stanley's imagination? No, I shouldn't care to put myself in the position of having said that they are purely the figment of Mr. Stanley's imagination. But there is one point of fact, or of error, that should certainly cause us to question these records. Here is a river called the, uh, the Lua Laba River, indicated as flowing north and being the true source of the Nile. And further, gentlemen, indicated as being at an elevation of 2,000 feet above sea level. 2,000 feet. As we all know, our eminent colleague, Mr. Hampton, measured the elevation of the Nile above Gondokoro at 2,169 feet. Therefore, it seems, if we are to believe these records, that we must also believe that water could flow over 700 miles uphill. <laughs> Dr. Livingston indicated the Lua Lava as a possible, not the actual source of the Nile. The word possible, Mr. Stanley, does not appear on the map. Dr. Livingston said it was possible this was not the Nile, but the Congo. 
As to that, Mr. Stanley, even an elementary knowledge of geography should tell you that the Congo flows not north, but west. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, assuming that anybody found anybody, is it not likely that Stanley did not discover Livingston, but that Livingston discovered Stanley? <laughs> It must be obvious to even the most gullible of us that Mr. Stanley has attempted to make this honorable gathering the victim of a colossal fraud. You ought to know about fraud, you old rhinoceros. Sit down. It was my privilege to spend some time with Mr. Stanley at Zanzibar, where I had gone to be with my son, who had courageously led a bona fide expedition to find Dr. Livingston. <laughs> when I told Mr. Stanley that Dr. Livingston was dead, he refused to believe me. Why, I ask you? Why? Because it wasn't true. Wasn't it because the London Globe had stolen a march on the New York Herald? Or was it because Mr. Stanley had come 11,000 miles for a story and couldn't find one? Gentlemen, among unscrupulous publishers, the method is as old as the newspaper business itself. If you can't find a story, you hire yourself away with pen and paper and you make one. I have here before me a copy of the New York Herald. With your kind indulgence, I will read a small portion of an editorial appearing in it. And I intend to continue making news while my competitors sit around waiting for it to happen. That editorial, gentlemen, is signed by Mr. James Gordon Bennett, publisher of the New York Herald, and employer of Mr. Henry M. Stanley. Have you anything further to say, Mr. Stanley, before this meeting votes on your report? Go on, get up and give it to them. You must. You must, please. Mr. Chairman, and I feel that I should say, gentlemen of the jury, since you have seen fit to turn this hearing into a trial, I stand before you accused of being a cheat, a liar, and a forger. Unfortunately, gentlemen, when you question my integrity, you nullify at the same time the discoveries of Dr. Livingston, and you condemn a great man to oblivion. A great man whom this honorable gathering seems determined to wipe out with a vote. Although today he is still roaming the jungle and swamp, alone and fever ridden. Accomplishing more in every single day than you in your combined lives will ever accomplish. You armchair geographers who have never explored anything deeper than a plum pudding. I realize that this hall is charged with prejudice, and to raise my voice here is to cry out in the wilderness. But I would be violating a sacred trust if I did not cry out, even though only the walls hurt me. The walls and a handful of faithful friends. Gentlemen, I, I do not like to think that I am expecting too much when I ask tolerance and fair play from my fellow countrymen. Yes. I was born in England. I went to school here. Not at Eton or Harrow, but at St. Asaph's Workhouse for the Children of Paupers. All I ever knew of England was the poverty and brutality of the workhouse. I grew up with the lesson of my youth burned into my soul. I asked nothing of other men and I gave nothing. A year ago, in darkest Africa, I met a man who restored my faith in the England I had learned to hate as a child. And now you gentlemen are destroying the faith he built in me. 
as you seem bent on destroying every other great accomplishment of the greatest man I have ever known. Dr. Livingston is out there. He is old and he is sick. And he needs your help to carry on the great work he has undertaken. The work that is indicated, however inadequately, upon those maps. Reject those maps, withhold your aid, and you destroy him. Reject those maps and you close Africa for generations to come. Reject those maps, gentlemen, and you break faith with the greatest geographer and one of the greatest men of our times. Gentlemen, the choice is yours. Take your vote. I am sure that Dr. Livingston himself would say, I leave it with you. Oh, that was glorious. Fine words, Mr. Chairman, but still not one word of proof. <laughs> Henry Forrester. I move that this meeting go on record by putting Mr. Stanley's report to a vote. Yeah. 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 Gentlemen, all those who are in favor of accepting Mr. Stanley's report, please rise. those who are opposed to accepting Mr. Stanley's report, please rise. Gentlemen, the verdict is clear. It is the sense of this meeting that Mr. Stanley's claim be rejected. The chair will entertain a motion. Sir John! Sir John Gresham! Yes, what is it? A message from Paris. Well, son, I guess you know now how I feel when people won't believe what I tell them. Stanley! Stanley! They are calling the meeting back to order. What of it? Something's happened. We'd better go back. Come on. I've just received a communication from London which I feel is of the utmost importance. I will read it to you without comment. It is from Lord Belhampton and is addressed to me. Sir, a message has just been received from Zanzibar. The body of Dr. David Livingston has been brought to the coast by native bearers. Dr. Livingston died several months ago on a journey to the Lualaba River. That is not all, gentlemen. The letter goes on. The bearers also delivered to the British consul at Zanzibar a last message written by Dr. Livingston, in which the doctor mentions Mr. Henry M. Stanley. The following message contains Dr. Livingston's last request and is addressed to Mr. Stanley. Too weak to go on. Have asked that my heart be buried here, together with my dreams. My son, the torch has fallen from my hand. Come and relight it. Mr. Chairman? What ties? Mr. Chairman, I have the very great honor to propose that the previous resolution be stricken from the minutes of this meeting and that we accept Mr. Stanley's report. And with our acceptance, Tender him our humble apologies for our stupidity and bad manners, in which I, Mr. Stanley, have been the greatest offender. Yeah.